The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. It's Wednesday. You know that I love Wednesday because in just a moment we're going to be joined by Dr. Doreen Grampache. She's going to be answering your questions for Ask Dr. Doreen. And a little bit later on in this hour, we're going to be talking with Christopher Miyaki about a really amazing new app that you're going to really enjoy and be able to use with your kids at home as a tool in conjunction with skills. It's going to blow your mind. And then later after that, we'll have Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. And Emily Island is going to be here to talk about safety issues, some of the more recent stories in the news, and how we can avoid having those things happen with our kids with just a few simple lessons. Really exciting day for us. Uh, but I want to remind you at the start of this show that this entire show is meant to be interactive. We want your input. We want your questions and also suggestions from you on things that you would like to see covered here on the show. Emily's going to cycle through some of the different ways you can get in touch with us. I'm going to remind you that if you go to our homepage, which is www.autism-live.com, you have an opportunity to not only watch the live show or a recently recorded live show, but you can also interact. There's a lovely white box there. Put your cursor there, type away, hit enter, and it shows up here on our screen in almost real time. There's about a minute lag, we've discovered. Uh, but it's free. You don't have to log in. You don't have to give us your information. In fact, you are completely anonymous to us unless you give us your information. If you want us to get back to you about something, you will need to do that. I have a way of removing that information so that our audience at home cannot see it. So you can stay anonymous, except to us. We hope that you will participate. And by the way, if you go to our YouTube page, we hope that you'll subscribe because not only will you be able to see our most recently recorded live shows, but also our highlight reels, which will save you time. You'll be able to search topics that you want to know more about. So we hope that you will participate, but I don't want to wait any longer. Let's get to it with Ask Dr. Doreen. Dr. Doreen Grandpiche is the Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Doreen Grandpiche. Dr. Grandpiche. Dr. Doreen Grandpiche. Dr. Doreen Grandpiche is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen, our very special guest, Dr. Doreen Grandpache is here Good with morning. us. Good, Good morning. Good morning and welcome. We so love it when you come and Thank answer you. questions. I don't, I try not to miss this session for anybody. <laughs> we appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Grandpache, as you know, if you watch the show, is an expert in the field of autism, has been working with our kids for multiple decades. And I always like to remind everybody and to remind you, because I, I think that you're tremendous, that she's a visionary in this field. You're, uh, you're my weekly reader. <laughs> I really appreciate I it. So. You're very kind. Thank you. Well, you change lives around the world. Thank and, you. And this is a wonderful opportunity for more people to hear your wisdom and to be able to ask questions. But we always remind people at home that you can't give child-specific advice in this format. It would be a disservice to all of our kids who are so individual. Right. But having said that, we can ask questions and you can point us in directions and, and, and ask more questions as often is the case so that it helps us to hone what we're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely, that's correct. And I always say that to our viewers as well. I Sometimes I just don't have enough information. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times we can help you with some general responses and or give you some direction. 
um, very, very rarely, uh, unless I've seen the child, you know, sometimes parents uh, will actually write questions on here and I know their children. So yes. it's much easier for me to respond quite accurately. Wonderful. And and the advice has been so great. We, we now regularly on a weekly basis hear back from people That's about terrific. how much it has helped them. And, and as always, that is reinforcing to all of us. If you've gotten some information right. here on the show and it's been useful to you, or if it led you down a different path, you asked a different question it led to something else we'd love to hear that we love to hear back right. updates um, in fact there are so many different ways that you can contact us here and a question came in on our a private message came in on our Facebook this week mm -hmm. um, a young mom who just had her baby, but she's studying to be a BCBA. She's mm -hmm. taken a little bit of time off for her baby. Uh, two things that she wanted to know about. She was recently at an event, and another mom was there with a four-year-old girl. And the mom started talking to her about some things about autism, revealed that there are many people in the family who are on the spectrum. The mom has a real fear of her child being diagnosed, mm -hmm. does not want to go and get the diagnosed because of all the stigma mm -hmm. from all of the other families family mem members being diagnosed, doesn't really want to do that. She encouraged the mom to, to get the diagnosis, but wanted to know, first of all, what can I do, what more can I do to convince this mom to take some action? That's a, there's a lot of stuff in there. That's a, it's very difficult. I mean, I guess the most uh, convincing argument is that the earlier you know, the sooner you are getting the help that you need. Mm -hmm. That's probably the most important thing is that, and I think you said the child's four. Yes. You know, and it, if by four, it should be pretty evident. So uh, if there are signs or not, you, you know, get it over with once and for all and, and no, dragging it on and not worrying or not, or worrying and not doing anything about it is not helpful in any way. It is very difficult when you have other people in the family because then they are all commenting on things and, it, and it's quite difficult. There are some pretty good, uh, you know, you can actually online go and access some screening tools mm -hmm. that will help you identify whether there is something to be concerned about. Generally speaking, you're looking at any delay in language, um, some, you know, social differences, mm -hmm. and then some possible um, kind of repetitive stereotypical behaviors, maybe differences in sensory uh, integration or how, how the individual takes in sensory, uh, I don't know, like how they react to lights mm -hmm. or sounds or if they crave textural types of sensory interaction. So there's those types of things that you're looking for as red flags, language being the primary one. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it is so important to know as soon as you possibly can mm -hmm. and because it, it will immediately guide you right away. I mean, for instance, if I had a four-year-old, which, you know, when I was, when my son was, I think, hmm, one, one and a half or so, and I'm a trained clinician, so I'm watching my kids very, very carefully. But at one, or maybe it was even later than one, maybe 14 months or so, he hadn't really developed a lot of speech or any speech. And usually my daughter, who was before him, had already started speaking at nine months. Mm -hmm. And that was early, so you know, you're supposed to have your first words around one. But my son, but you know, also for people to know, if you have a higher level of development in the motor arena, then your ver vocal is delayed. So it's one or the other. Usually, yeah. you have more development in motor or vocal. And so with my son, he was very active, but he wasn't speaking. And so. I was like, this isn't going to work. And the reason he wasn't speaking was, I think, a combination of things. One was that we had multiple languages in the home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, his dad's German, I'm Iranian, and then, of course, there's English, and there was a lot of German in the house at mm -hmm. that time because nannies and so on. But then also because he had pretty severe allergies, and mm -hmm. I could see them. Like, he was very restricted in what he would eat. He was very, very picky. And it was beginning to freak me out a little bit. You know, it was like a struggle. Mm -hmm. So... I immediately, uh, you know, took him in, figured out he's got allergies, got him on a special diet, took away milk, um, you know, that changed his life, yeah. and put together a very basic logbook for him, and I f trained all the nannies and everyone and school and, you know, daycare and whatever, and forced everybody to do some language stuff with him, and within a couple of months, he was uh, speaking just fine mm -hmm. with a German accent, but <laughs> just fine, it sounded like Arnold, but anyway, um, 
So it's just the sooner you know, the sooner you can do something about it. And if you leave things too long, then you're wasting time. Your time is very, very precious in this in this field. And I've heard you talk before about the you know delays and diagnosis, and that the diagnosis all it serves to do is help us to get funding. Absolutely. Do they, if, if it's so stigmatizing to her to get the diagnosis, can she just go and get help and help with the absolutely. delays? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you do not have to go and see. Here's here's the problem nowadays and I don't know where this parent is but do, uh, uh, what the, state we uh, they're actually abroad they're in England okay so it won't matter in England because okay. he, here of course if you don't have a diagnosis your access to funding is mm -hmm. limited in England there isn't really any good funding so you know you don't even need to if you're in England and there, you're gonna have a harder time finding really hardcore a lot of hardcore behavior analysts for instance you have many more here but what I would really suggest is start you know identify what areas you're concerned about or just just do just get on skills and do the skills index if nothing else just do the the assessment on skills and that'll tell you if your child's doing fine or has some delays and if they have some delays start working on those areas and just start getting uh, your child some help because um, you know, he, you can come out of it pretty mm -hmm. fast if you get going pretty soon. And I would just remind everybody that the skills index, that's part of skills, the assessment portion. You can go to skillsforautism.com. There is a 15 day free trial. It's actually a 14 day trial um, that you can do. And that's, and everybody has access to that around the world. It's um, on the internet. Mm -hmm. And you can do that and your family would never know that you were doing it. That's right. So the other question that she had, because she's studying to be a BCBA. Uh, we do jargon of the day on the days that you're not here. We take one word and one phrase and we try to figure out what it means in, in a context that we can understand. Uh, so her question was, and she's done all this looking it up and she still doesn't understand affect. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to save this for Dr. Grand Pichet. So can you tell us and, and make sense of us when somebody's talking about affect with an A, mm -hmm. not effect, but affect in, the, mm -hmm. in terms of autism, what does that mean? Emotional expression. Okay. It just means. So what you got going on? Yeah, it basically is sort of like uh, if you are. So some of the diagnoses depend on. So for instance, if you're depressed, mm -hmm. the appropriate affect would be, you know, depressed look. Okay. If you're depressed and you're giggling, there's something wrong with your affect. I see. Right. So there's. It's not. It doesn't just coordinate with how you actually feel. So when you have an affect that is completely different from your diagnosis, then there's something wrong. So in other words, either your diagnosis is wrong or it has affected you to a point where it's uh, actually causing pretty severe neurosis and now you're you know, in a different level of trauma. So affect is pretty important. It's one of the things that we, we look at in order to identify or verify or validate a diagnosis. Okay, great. Well, that makes perfect sense mm -hmm. to me. Another question that we had that came in on the live feature this morning, people want to know, is it still one in 50 boys? Yeah, that's what they say. I mean, that's, you know, we don't know. I, I, these numbers are not all that accurate to me. You know, for me, if I come, if I start in a field where it's one in fifteen thousand, and I'm still practicing, and now it's one in eighty-eight, there's, right. you know, there's some. I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure about any of these numbers. There have been studies that show that it's higher than than one in eighty-eight. Um, there's been some data already collected that shows it's closer to one in fifty. Uh, boys and girls so that that would mean that it's higher in boys again um, it's always a four to one ratio of boy to girl so that has still in fact yesterday the day before yesterday I was reading some literature that I didn't get to finish but they're now looking to see whether the ratio is still four to one okay um, so that would be kind of interesting because if it isn't it tells you quite a lot about the the prevalence and incidence changes of autism over the course of the years if that has changed if the ratio has changed but um, it is still somewhere I you know in the US the, the published uh, number is one in 88 um, I think it's probably a little bit higher um, and unfortunately, it is still, I think, it is still increasing. I'm not sure. I mean, that's a pretty high number if you think about it. Um, and that's just 
autism. See, what'll be very interesting to me, Shannon, is that these numbers came out with autism. I'm wondering now that they've changed the diagnosis and it's more ASD, which is a much broader uh, classification, if that number has increased mm -hmm. or if because of the social communication disorder and if some kids have been removed and placed into that, which God, I hope it doesn't happen. But if they have, then uh, I wonder if the number is lower. I don't know. We'll have to see. And it'll be interesting because what I didn't understand until recently is that the lag of when we get the numbers, it's, it's numbers from way before. Extremely. That, that 1 in 88 number still does not include my son. Those were numbers really? that were taken. In, uh, my understanding is that those are numbers taken in 2010 from, nine, chil yeah, nine from, from children who were... Diagnosed 2007 or something like that. I'm not I sure. I don't know, but I remember looking at it and going, that still doesn't include my oh, son. Yeah, it's very old. And yeah, that's exactly the point. I was going to say that these numbers come out a couple of years, two to three years later after uh, the publication takes a while as well. And then, of course, getting the information from the diagnosis to the to the authors takes a while. So, yeah. yeah. So it, it will be. And so I would imagine when we get the next set of numbers, it's it, will, be. it will have, have been taken before the DSM-5 took effect. So we'll all be still trying to make some sense of it. And I, and I do wonder sometimes as a parent, whether that's deliberate, that we convolute the numbers deliberately so that we don't all panic. I don't think so. I mean, here's because with research, what happens is there is a lag time period. Mm -hmm. So, like, we, a, a group of uh, physicians and scientists, um, I was very lucky to be part of that group. We uh, all met, and I think it was, uh, gosh, I want to say 2000, maybe nine or 10. And uh, that's what, three, four years ago, and the publication isn't even out yet because wow. there's a group of us and all we, ha what we really did, was, it was a, it was a uh, literature review. But I'm just saying that like, it does take a really long time before things get published because, or become validated because it's not yeah. a, it's a very important process and there, it requires validation. Absolutely. Uh, even right now when we want to do any kind of basic research project, um, we can't even look at all the kids we have. We have to only look at kids who've received let's say, an, an ADOS or some standardized measure because mm -hmm. for research purposes you have to be, or for publication purposes, you have to be very, very documented and strict about yeah. the diagnosis. So I'm pretty sure, you know, usually in the past they used to always look at numbers from regional centers in California because that's where uh, that was the best tracking of this disorder for for a very long time, right? Regional centers have been tracking the the prevalence of autism for a very long time in California, but you know is and and a lot of studies ba were based on California numbers and a lot of the ratios were, were based on California numbers and I don't know if California is really. Uh, representative of the rest of the country. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of that sort Absolutely. of stuff. Absolutely. Uh, well, well, we'll look forward to the next set of numbers and to see what happens as a result of that. Right. And hope that it just leads to more funding. Whatever the number says, if it leads to funding, I will appreciate that. Right. Because that's really what's important. We're going to take a short break and come back more with Dr. Doreen Grandpache, so stick with us. guys, welcome back to Smarty. It's January and a whole new year has gone by. To commemorate that, Autism Live and Smarty have decided to give you a template to make your very own time capsule. The materials you'll be needing are glue, a jar, photos, keepsakes, pen, and a template you can print from facebook.com slash autism live. Here's the template that I printed out from our Facebook page. Depending on the skill of your child, they can do this independently or you're going to help them fill out all the questions. Once you have finished filling out the time capsule sheet, I've left two spaces on the top, one for a school photo, one for a family photo. Feel free to glue an image there. Now that I've glued the photos onto my sheet, now I'm going to grab my jar and start filling it up with all the things I would want to remember from the year that just passed. I would say include photos, mementos, toys, things that are going to be really important to you at this time and moment that you'll be excited to see later in the future. Once you're done filling up your jar with all the things that were important to you for the year 2013, you're going to want to seal it up. And it's up to you for how long you want to keep it locked up. 
Time capsules are a great way to remember where you have been and where you're going. So, I hope you really enjoy this activity, and until next time, craft on, guys. Can you see me flying by your side? Welcome back to Ask Dr. Doreen. We have Dr. Doreen Grampuche with us, and last week we talked about on the show the Skills by BIP Builder, and mm -hmm. you were talking about that because it launched last week. Uh, an amazing online tool that, it, uh, you know, I encourage everybody to go and check it out, and it's a standalone now. Somebody had written in and said, where can we get this BIP Builder? So I just want to let you know if you go to www.skillsbipbuilder.com, that is where you want to go uh, to get the VIP Builder. Really um, an amazing uh, tool. And people should watch last week's show because you talked extensively about that. And we even did a highlight of it on our YouTube channel. So we don't need to revisit all that. But uh, truly a remarkable tool. Yeah, I know. I love it. I, I really love it. And, you know, you can find links to uh, the VIP Builder just on the skills website. Absolutely. The card website, anywhere you go. Yeah, Absolutely. It's a fabulous tool. Uh, we had another person who wrote in and said, hello, I'm an educational professional working with children with special needs. Is there any training online that I can use to get a certification in ABA? Uh, mm, well, we... So this is a, a, a person who has is a teacher of, of an education type? professional. Right. So I would assume either uh, sure. you know regular classroom teacher or maybe sure. special education teacher. She says working with children with special needs. Right. So I mean I'm just trying. Okay. So you could of course take a series of courses and and try to go for actual board certification, which is a is a process. I heard that now it's nine courses for the BCBA, which is a lot, um, and. I think it's something like 750 or a thousand something hours of uh, internship or mentorship. Uh, so it takes quite a long time. But that I would only do that if you really are intending to become an expert in this field or you know uh, fluent in this field. Um, otherwise, I would recommend that you look on the IBT site, which is the Institute for Behavioral Training, and they have a lot of different types of trainings there, which you will receive a certificate for completing each of those trainings. And I know that we are giving continuing education to teachers. Uh, and other professionals, many other professionals listed on there. In fact, IBT has, I think, a tag, just a whole tab for teachers. And so that's probably where you'd want to go because you'll get a lot of uh, instructional videos and good, good um, help for uh, any individual on not just the autism spectrum, but with a uh, developmental disability. Absolutely. Great, great site. So ibehavioraltraining.com, another place that you can go. Great, great information. Um, we have a question here. My son is four years old, and he just lost one of his favorite cousins. She passed yeah. away. And I was wondering, what is the best way to go about telling mm -hmm. him he's mild functioning and is a huge, this is a huge change for him? Yeah. We, you know, recently, um, Nancy and I talked talked before the holidays because uh, Nancy Allspot Jackson had gone through the loss of first both of her parents in the last two years and then uh, another pet had just passed away and the day later their horse passed away and we were talking about how difficult it is to get Very. somebody on the spectrum to understand I, hello it's hard for adults to understand what yeah. death means and the permanence of it but how you explain that to a child and then a child on the spectrum and if it's somebody that is very close to them, favorite cousin, another child, I'm sure the whole family is struggling with it. Yeah, that's a very difficult thing. And this is one of those questions that's a little bit difficult to respond to just because I don't really know the, the functioning of the child and how how much he or she knows. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of, first of all, I should say that there's very good material on grief counseling mm -hmm. for children. Um, we go through certain stages uh, for when we experience grief. And um, depending on, you know, the level of consciousness, I suppose, that we have or the level of awareness, we will go through some of these stages or all of these stages, for instance, denial or, you know, I'm not sure how much your child already understands about what happened. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if, let's say, one child might have a con just 
the basic concept of or may have had this experience before in their lives or it might be the very first time they've lost someone and they might not even understand what it is to die um, or you know is there a place like heaven I don't know how much you've actually um, told your child but generally speaking the idea would be to try to um, you know, establish that there is a good place. Generally, kids for children, you really want to make sure that they understand that two things, I think. One is that this individual did not go to a bad place, mm -hmm. that they went to a good place, and, uh, you know, just basically that this happens throughout life and this is a normal process, and that uh, them leaving has really nothing to do with the child. A lot of times, children interpret it as this person has gone because they don't like me or they're just gone because, you know, maybe people, whatever. They don't, if you don't understand the concept of death, right. you, as far as you know, the child's just, the, the individual's just gone. Yeah. You know, and that's sort of a very scary thing. So, again, depending on how much your child understands, I would look online and look at the stages of grief. This is a sort of a psychological phenomenon and you, we've, they've already de defined the stages you generally go through with grief and loss. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross did yes. a lot of work in that area. You exactly. can Google her and, and, That's right. and you can see a lot of information about That's that. That's right. And it's very useful and very helpful and a lot of people have taken the, her work and kind of uh, developed it for children and exactly what you're supposed to okay. say to children. In fact, uh, this is all online, it's all published because unfortunately we've had so many uh, the horrible incidences occur at schools and preschools. Even and so, right, yeah. and a lot of this sort of stuff comes up online because teachers are looking for ways to explain to their students yeah. what's happening. So that's one whole thing, but generally speaking, uh, loss of someone that you care about, the number one result is you fear being alone and you start to develop anxiety. You do not develop depression as a first step, you develop anxiety, you develop fear of, you know, being left alone. Um, safety issues and kind of being anxious about your own safety. So this is a time where I would recommend that you spend a lot of time with your child, um, engage your child in a lot of activities, uh, you know, try to do fun things as much as you can. I know it's very, very hard for the whole family. Uh, try to do as much as you can with like activities that are fun going away doing things, you know Going to movies whatever it is that you can do it's similar to Having a divorce, you know having mm -hmm. a child go through a divorce situation, but not at least in a divorce You continue hopefully to see both parents right. and you know that they're around. It's just a change in life but you know, a, a death of a loved one is just very difficult for children. And I, you know, we just uh, a year ago when my mom passed away, we watched with Jem, and he he dealt with it so much better than I thought he was going to. But we watched him very closely, and it seeped out in very strange ways. Mm. Um, you know that we didn't see anything for a little while, and then we went through a little period of anxiety um, that had nothing to do with. Um, and we've seen in the, in recent months that uh, how it has manifested itself is that he wants a sibling. It's almost as though he feels like one thing is gone, so I get something in its place. Yes. Um, you know, fortunately, that's something that, we, you know, we've been talking about anyway, is ad right. adopting. But it, it's been very interesting to watch. It wasn't my expectation, and I had to remove the idea of what it was going to look like, grief was going to look like in him, and just watch it you know, bubble up and deal with it as it came. Absolutely. Uh, it's been a fascinating process. But our, our kids are so much more resilient than I think a lot of us realize. They are, but it is, uh, it's, I mean, the thing is that they don't, they often don't show, uh, you know, they, they try to hide or they're not even aware of, like you said, how things affect them, mm -hmm. you know. So you might have, and I consider Jam to be actually very, like intellectual you know he's he's quite an intellectual <laughs> but other a lot of kids will just have uh, other types of you know like they'll start hoarding mm. for instance because mm. that's something that will give them safety they'll start developing some obsessive compulsive routines mm. because those are things that will exhibit through their anxiety there's stuff like that that happens with our kids and with my kids and they're all different ages and they're typically developing but I always when I see anxious behavior anxiety even things like overeating or you know those types or just uh, 
chaos, you know, like not taking care of themselves or so on, then I know it's either depression or anxiety and I start okay. to really look into it. Okay, good, good advice for all of us. All right, we have a question. Um, can what looks like SIB, frequent closed fist hits to the chest, leg, and head, mostly during ABA sessions, have an anxiety or sensory component? He's very sensory seeking with smells, oral chewing, and jumping. He sometimes hits himself hit himself when he's doing a preferred activity as well. His hits never leave a mark and our therapists are working hard to decrease and replace this behavior. Sometimes I think he doesn't even realize he does it. Any thoughts and thank you. Many thoughts. The key thing on that is that you wrote um, during therapy, right? And if the hitting occurs only during therapy, it's almost 99% I'm sure that it's attention seeking. Okay. Uh, in other words, not just attention seeking, but more like trying to get the attention of the therapist and avoid doing what they're doing. In other words, uh, you know, I don't want to do this therapy. So it's, right. a, it's a sort of an avoidance or escape function. Right. Uh, but it has very much to do with the therapist being present or an individual being present. First question I have for, for this parent is, does your child do this alone? Mm. When they're alone, do they do this? Mm. Um, second, if you say no to that, then that means that it re definitely has to do with a person being present. Now we want to determine if it has to do with the person being present and placing demands mm. or being present and doing something fun. So then you will, the next question is, does it happen with uh, when a person is playing with him uh, or does it happen only when you're requesting something or placing a demand? So if it happens in the presence of a person and even if, if you're having fun, it's possibly something that has become a habit. It could potentially have started with some sort of sensory need. And yes, you have to try to kind of block it, but replace it with some other thing that gives him a sensory need, you know, satisfies his need. Uh, and if it happens only when a demand is placed, then it is clearly a, a, a behavior that's done in order to avoid demands. And so then you have to ignore it and continue to place demands. Uh, perhaps make the demands a little bit less hard and shorter, okay. but nevertheless, uh, you know, put it on extinction and continue to place demands. So this is where your your you, your group of therapists should actually someone should have done a, a functional assessment to mm -hmm. identify exactly why it's happening, and without knowing that, there's many different things you could you know you might be doing the wrong thing. So that's very important. But yes, I've had children who have done this sort of thing just for sensory uh, stimulation, in which case you would want to make sure that you are providing them with other sensory stimulation when it's a more appropriate time. Okay, great. And then uh, write into us and give us an update on that. Yes, uh, please. About, about how that's working. Oh, and, and also this is one of those great behaviors that if you go to the Bit Builder, there is a CIFA on there. CIFA is the, uh, the mm. hard uh, indirect functional assessment and there you can answer questions and it will help you identify the function and hey not only that it'll give you like 20 different interventions that you can do absolutely great great uh, advice and again you can go to skillsbipbuilder.com for that okay another question here or do, would you like to take a break i'm fine okay great. <laughs> i'm going to power on then because sure. we're getting through questions uh my niece in the first grade is recently diagnosed with adhd and is taking drugs during school days however she has no motivation to participate in schoolwork. Mm -hmm. Now I have a three-year-old son with PDD NOS and I see lots of similarities between her and my son. She just has everything in a milder degree. What is the best way to figure out her issue? Is it PDD, ADHD, CAPD and develop the proper educational plan? She gets along with friends well but overall immature. But again she is in first grade. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, and there, it is a continuum, so this is a very good question, you know, and we have children who will go, let's say, from uh, autism or autistic disorder to PDD to ADHD and, and then hopefully nothing. But uh, the best way to identify what her issues are is to have a, someone who's an expert in either diagnosis or both um, do a differential diagnosis. It's kind of an important thing. There are certain things that are quite different 
Like okay. there are characteristics of ADHD that are very different. And so it's not that hard to do a diagnosis um, and to identify. In the past, and, and this is what's a little bit uh, confusing, right now might not be a very good time for you to do this because not a lot of people, there are not a lot of psychologists who have adequately become fluent with the DSM-5. And with the DSM-5, it's the first year ever that allows you to diagnose, uh, you know, uh, ASD and ADHD. That was not allowed in the past. I know that it was done. It was done erroneously. And a lot of times I would find a diagnosis that would say autism or ASD and then, or autism disorder, autistic disorder, which is what happened in the past, and as well as ADHD. And I'd always say, you can't do that. You can't do that. And so the reason that I think it's allowed now is that ASD as a whole is sort of a broader category and um, you know it, you are allowed to say and it does not necessarily indicate that you will have all of the symptoms of ADHD. ADHD has some of the other stuff going on like for instance you know there are differential diagnosis questions like very you know just off the top of my head and I diagnose kids with ADHD and there's two types there's the inattentive and the hyperactive or the combined so child could have inattention or like difficulty paying attention or could be hyperactive or both mm -hmm. but there are questions in in the diagnosis of ADHD that really don't come up in autism for instance does the child misplace or lose items all the time mm -hmm. so there are very key questions that uh, you know, does the child interrupt conversation all the time? There's certain things that will kind of help you differentiate. And it is actually kind of important. There are similarities. The similarities have to do with not being able to focus or pay attention on uh, to something for a long period of time. But there are a lot of differences. And while a lot of interventions like ABA, of course, will help e either child, it doesn't matter, skills or be all of the stuff we've developed will help either child, it doesn't, really doesn't matter. But then it's still important to know what, what to focus on. So, you know, and then here's another answer to this. If it was I, if it was me as a parent and I was looking at a two children and I was thinking, oh, this child has some PDD features and this child has some ADHD issues, I would still go ahead and say, please get on skills, answer all the questions there because skills will tell you what to do no matter what the diagnosis is. Right. Um, so, you know, there's certain things that are, that are important for the diagnosis. You will learn from the diagnosis mm -hmm. where you should focus. But having said that, um, aside from that, you can just do a, a checklist of all the skills and deficits and start working on them. So is it oversimplifying it to say, you know, you, you, a child has something going on and whether it's inattentiveness or an inability to access and understand what's happening, they have something going on. And while that's going on, they fall behind. Yeah. And there's a, that is an absolute accurate statement, Sharon. Okay. You're totally right. There's there are some forms of kind of PDD and some forms of ADHD that would be almost uh, identical and it's very hard to tell the difference. For instance, I, I believe that some of our kids on the ASD spectrum, their problem really has a lot to do with uh, the speed that, at which they function. <laughs> now, we try very hard and we work on trying to slow our kids down to a certain level, but the truth is, if we are successful in slowing them down, great, then they start to pay attention and be able to learn. Same thing with ADHD, I and mean, there are some kids that are just process, they can't process information either because it's coming at them too slow yeah. or too fast for them. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're just, they, that ha you know, they miss all the information because of that. So, but having said that, yeah, I mean, your child is getting more and more delayed because there's something going on with how they process information. And so the mantra becomes getting your child caught up and never letting them fall behind, which is something that gets said at CARD all the time. Correct. We're going to get your child caught up and never let them fall behind again. And I think certainly as a parent, I understand you want to, you, you, we, we crave this Sometimes, you know, some people are afraid of the label, but some of us, we crave the label because we think we're going to understand it if there's a label. Right. And, and usually, you know, that's a fool's errand because then we don't understand it anymore. But if we put our attention towards, okay, my child is, is behind because of this and they're getting more and more behind every day, mm -hmm. what am I going to do to catch them up? Right. Um, that that's a more productive place to be in. Right. Okay. So uh, we can use things like IBT and we can use things like skills to, to accomplish 
accomplish that, to mm -hmm. learn the techniques. Mm -hmm. You go to ibehavioraltraining.com and to do the curriculum and to do the assessment, you go to skills. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's skillsforautism.com. Right. Uh, cool. All right. Uh, moving on, uh, my daughter is four years and a half. She has about a hundred words vocabulary and lately she requests things using one word at a time. Do you think she will be able to speak? And their secondary question is what's the best to do in order to make the child use those words, the hundred words that she's got? That's the kind of question I like. Yes, don't we? <laughs> She will not use more than single words unless she has to. That's the answer. So do not accept single words. Okay. Just that very easy. You can prompt her. You can give her visual cues. For instance, if she says juice and you want her to say, I want juice, start holding up three fingers and say, I want juice. And then very quickly, you won't have to say it. Mm -hmm. You'll just hold up three fingers and your child will know they have to say three words. Mm -hmm. um, if you want her to be more descriptive, pretend you don't know what they're talking about. Um, I want, you know, a book. I don't know what that means, which book. So you really need to, if a child has 100 words in their expressive vocabulary, that means they have a pretty strong receptive vocabulary, they understand quite a bit. So you would just tell them, not sure what you mean. And if the child doesn't understand, like it seems lost, mm -hmm. prompt them. Like prompt your child, so show them their options. Like for instance, they request a crayon, show them colors of crayons. Do you want the red one, the pink one? Which one do you want? You can prompt. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with prompting a child, but don't uh, accept the shorter answer. And start to do that sort of very consistently across the board with everyone in your child's universe mm -hmm. so that everybody is in agreement that this week we will have one word responses and we will visually prompt mm -hmm. you know next month we will be requesting at least two to three word responses and we can still visually prompt but at some point you have to keep increasing the stages so that it is three word responses or uh, even spontaneous speech and no prompts. So there's kind of a hierarchy of, you know, one word and a prompt, then one word, no prompt, then, you know, two words and a prompt, two word, no prompt, and three, and so on and so forth. And then th that would be just in terms of responding. Mm -hmm. Demanding, requesting should, should develop much, you know, straight following responding and basically be just almost as high. And you have to set a guideline for yourself so that in a few months, you're at a point where your child's using two, three word combinations. And by the way, depending on what your vocabulary is, I mean, if the vocabulary is all um, nouns, then your child has no adjectives to use or has no verbs to use. So make sure that the vocabulary includes other uh, grammatical structures. And, you know, all of this sort of stuff is very important. So, like, use a curriculum or use a professional. I have all of this written out in very great detail on the skills language programming because it's really important. If you start to try to teach your child uh, advanced sentences and they don't have the building blocks, they're just going to get frustrated. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm smiling because it's an exciting time in your home. Oh, yeah, it's awesome. I, I remember it's this awesome period of time. time from when, you know, when my child hadn't been speaking and then we had some labels. And, the, and then when we really got busy with language and, and I watched him ask for things Love it. and say, I want this and be excited because he got know, it. And then it was, a, a great it was just a, a time of a leap forward. Yeah. So get excited about the fact that you can do this. Yeah. You know, Maybe a day or two where, where your child will feel some frustration because they've been used to saying juice and the juice arrived. Right, right. Um, but, you know, there's a new sheriff in town and right. you got to say, I want juice or it's not going to happen. Exactly. But as soon as you do, it happens. Exactly. And then it's like a light bulb. In your home. It is. But it's all there in skills. You don't have to guess. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't right. have to go and get a PhD before you can start this. You could start it this afternoon. Absolutely. Okay, here's a fun one. How do you teach a child not to lie once they know how to lie? <laughs> it's awesome. I like that. I <laughs> love it. And I need to know. 
<laughs> yeah, that's a that's a uh, tough one because it really has to do with the different scenarios um, where certain lies, of course, are acceptable, other lies are not acceptable. I think it has to do. I think you would have to teach the child the consequences. In other words, if there is a if they lie the potential consequences and how they would hurt others and the same thing uh, with your child in other words if you lie to the child or if someone else lies to the child and depending again on your child I mean I assume that your child is at a pretty high level of comprehension to be able to lie mm -hmm. because lying requires a lot of perspective taking um, and if your child is lying then it's a matter of I would use comic strips, for instance, where I would draw out and say, so this is what really happened, but this is what you said, mm -hmm. and then have the child identify what the other person would believe and sort of act upon based on what they said, and then how it would cause a situation that could be harmful. Okay. And in reverse, I mean, I would make the child be the receiver of the lie as well. So I would also say, you know, um, you ask, you really want milk or whatever it is. You really want a lollipop. And I lie to you and I say, no, we don't have it. So then you become sad, you know, versus, um, and then I, someone else, like your sibling or something, goes and eats the lollipop. Now, mm -hmm. how do you feel? So just making sure the child starts to understand that the consequence of lying can be hurtful or harmful to, to an other, other person. Um, and, you know, if they still continue to lie, do what you do with every child. You punish them when they lie. Okay. Do you take away, uh, you know, uh, benefits or reinforcers when they are dishonest because we want to teach our kids to be honest. And on the same respect, when they tell the truth, truth we you reward it, right? Highly reward it and you be very, very positive about it. Yeah. And uh, I find it works a lot. I've always done this with my kids. They laugh when I do this. but. I find it helps a lot to reward the others when their behavior is good. It, uh, may, it produces sort of this competition and jealousy of who's uh, going to be more honest or who's going to be what. There you go. I, and I don't have the other siblings to, to play off of with Jem, but I do always remind him. And, you know, when he was younger, it was much harder. And when his language wasn't where it is now. But I remind him now that even if he's done something that would normally get him in trouble, it, it, the trouble is going to be much less if he's honest and he's honest about it quicker as opposed to later. If I find out the truth from someone, Someone else, right? It's always much worse for him. So yeah. I give him that incentive. Absolutely, that, yeah, and you know. I, I, take it a little deeper. I mean, if you're talking with, some, like I said, mm -hmm. Jem is my intellectual. <laughs> you're taking it to that <laughs> level with someone like Jem. I mm -hmm. would actually explain to him, like, why it upsets yes. you. The fact that you know, so that means that someone else is closer to you. Than uh, he is. Okay. That's gonna bother good. him. That's a good thing to remember. It's gonna bother him because he's gonna want to be the person that's the closest to sure. you, and if you hear it from someone else, that means that person is closer and more honest to you because the closer we are, the more honest we are. Okay, great. Good yeah. to know. Well, we this is all the time that we have for you because we have to give you up to yeah. uh, some other training that's happening here in the building. But thank, we you. thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. It was we'll, fun. We'll have you back next week. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, Christopher Miyaki is going to be here talking with us about a new app that's being launched today that you're really going to want to know about. And in fact, it can work in conjunction with skills. But aside from that, it's just plain fun and educational for our kids. So stick with us. Hello, fellow activists. Last week, I introduced you to step five of the 10 Steps to Empowerment, Shore Up Spiritually. Let's talk more about finding ways to do that how to find out what lifts your spirit, feeds your soul, and make it a practice. That practice is different things for different people. It could be the practice of meditation, of prayer, of community worship, or serving others. But it's the practice that will give you hope and faith and strength for the journey ahead, for the marathon journey of raising a child with autism. I get inspired every day by the families of children with autism that I come into contact with like the parents of the nonverbal child who have not given up hope that that child will speak one day, or the grandparents who should be enjoying their retirement but instead are joyfully raising their adult grandchild with autism, 
or the mother who is fighting for services for her daughter while her Marine husband is fighting a battle to keep our country safe. They all inspire me. My grandmother, Diddy, who is an angel who still guides me every day, had this quote inscribed in her Bible. I sought my soul, but my soul I could not see. I sought my God, but my God eluded me. I sought my brother, and I found all three. I think I'm finally starting to grasp the meaning of that. So feed your soul, lift your spirit, and until next time, keep the faith. Welcome back to Autism Live. As I mentioned before, we have CJ, uh, I had said Christopher Miyaki uh, before, and he is the creative director for games and mobile apps. And we've had you on the show before, and I have mentioned before on the show that you are also someone who has extensive experience working with children on the autism spectrum. And that in fact, for a brief period of time, you were one of the therapists coming to our home for GEM. So uh, I, I can attest to the fact that he knows what he's doing. He is great with our kids. So tell us a little bit about Camp Discovery and what's new today with Camp Discovery. Um, one thing that I guess with a lot of the apps that are out there right now that we found lacking was that there wasn't the aspect of um, reinforcement and preference assessments and um, rewarding the child for playing or learning. Yeah. And so that was a big thing we've always wanted to have in Camp Discovery. Um, it's a huge part of therapy. You know, if the kids aren't uh, motivated to learn or don't know what they're working for, yeah. um, the learning process doesn't work as well. And we should say, kids love to play on apps, they love to play on iPads, they love to play on phones, they love to do that. But when we switch to an educational app, sometimes it just isn't as reinforcing. So you guys have bumped up the game on this and made sure that it's going to be something that's reinforcing so they're going to love playing it with it like they would love playing a game that isn't educational. Yeah, I mean, it was always a kind of a step um, ahead of just doing it, you know, with flashcards with a therapist, yeah. that a, a therapist could use this application, but we wanted to make it so kids would want to play it outside of therapy <laughs> or have it, you know, find something they can, they can learn and, and still have a good time doing it. Um, and then the other feature was the uh, ability to track progress. Um, essential for parents. Essential for parents, yes. Yeah. So um, every time they play, it gets updated. Uh, there's graphs for each level. Um, and the parent can see how they're progressing through the different uh, lessons. It's really amazing. And so where can they go to get Camp Discovery? Um, it is now on the iTunes store Okay. Uh, for iPads. Uh, we're working on the iPhone release as well as Android. And cost? Uh, cost, the app is free. Free. Yeah. We love that. So if you go to the iTunes store today, you can get the upgraded version of Camp Discovery. You can sit with a child and, and watch them have a ball with it. You'll see the preference assessment where they get to, it's really like customizing it for the individual child to make sure that it's reinforcing to them, correct? Yeah. Uh, before we had one animation play, um, but with any kid, they have all have different um, right. desires and things that they find reinforcing. So we put in six different animations or six different buttons with each with two animations. And so they can kind of pick and choose the ones they want. We track that. And um, while they're playing the game, those animations that they chose uh, the most uh, are replayed. And then once they, if they do well and they complete a task, then they get a mini game. Yes, we have three games. There's uh, a firework game, uh -huh. a balloon game, and a shapes game. I'm excited. Um, they can play them for, I think it's about 30 seconds uh -huh. after each one. And those are all adjustable uh, in the parent settings area. So, And then they go back to, into learning again. Mm -hmm. So it's making sure that keeping them involved so that they'll want to use the app more. Really remarkable. You want to go to the iTunes store, look for Camp Discovery, and it's free. Uh, really, really remarkable. And there's many more things that are coming. You've got a lot of stuff that you're getting re ready to roll out, but this is uh, a really new addition that you've got going to it. So uh, really remarkable. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to go into the app, and we're going to play a little. I, I want to see the firework game in particular. You know I'm a firework fanatic. So we're going to take a look at that and look at the preference assessments so that you guys can see exactly what it is that we're talking about, how it decides what the child will find reinforcing. So stick with us. The Institute for Behavioral Training provides courses in applied behavior analysis for the treatment of autism. 
Access IBTE learning videos on the move and learn at your own pace. I'm going to talk a little bit about intensity. IBTE learning makes any location your classroom on the go. So our objectives for today are to really learn what is autism and how is it diagnosed. Get professional guidance with IBT face-to-face -face training. IBT face-to-face -face training courses prepare you to effectively implement ABA-based interventions. Choose between small group and one-to-one -one instruction. Earn BCBA supervision hours via one-to-one -one video conferencing. So I had a chance to review your BIP today. You know what? It looked really good. You did a good job with it. IBT continuing education courses. Earn credit through webinars, conferences, article reviews, and e-learning videos. You can learn more at ibehavioraltraining.com. IBT, 360 degrees of ABA training. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're here with CJ Miyaki. Am I saying that right? Yes. Okay. Didn't When you came to our house, I wasn't using your last name. So, um, but in any case, CJ is now the creative director for games and mobile apps. And he is showing us Camp Discovery, this wonderful tool. This is a free app that you can get on iTunes for your child to be playing on their iPad. Uh, so if you've done therapy and, and you, you know, let's say your child had two sessions in a day, but now there's a little bit of downtime in between and as a parent you're wanting to maximize all the things that you can so for maximum learning and you know a lot of times we'll give a reward give the iPad to the child or you're in the car you're on the way to OT the child's got the iPad your child can continue to learn using this app so um, we've got it mirrored so that uh, CJ you can show us um, so go ahead and, and show us how this app actually works <clears throat> And I, and I love that there are going to be many more games that are going to be coming along with this. Um, and, and we should mention that part of this is that if you are a skills user, eventually you're going to be able to log in to your skills account. And every time your child is playing on the game, when they master a skill on the game, it will notify the skills account as well. So you'll have a way of tracking it there in addition to the tracking that's on the game as well. Is that correct? Yes. You'll have uh, the list of all the targets or exemplars that are in the game and then you can go and check it out. Um, the supervisor would look and see if that um, is corresponding uh -huh. with how they're doing in their therapy sessions and yes. if it does they can go ahead and Okay great. So we start out. out and it's this wonderful map um, which you know is very pleasing to the eye and it's got movement in it really really great. So show us one of the things that where a child can go and how this preference assessment starts to work to begin with because we've talked before on the show about preference assessments how important it is it has to be rewarding and we should never assume what's rewarding to somebody and, and using this Okay, so you've gone into the settings. Tell us what you're doing. Okay, so in the settings option, there's music you can turn on and off, um, depending on if that's going to be distracting to your child. Um, the data tracking can be turned on and off. Um, now, the preference assessment in minigame, these are the options here. So if you choose one, every time the child goes through a round of learning, they are presented with a minigame after. And Obviously, for a child who's just starting out using something, you probably would want to start at one, so that they get to a mini game more often than not. But if the child, if you're, if the child is getting a little bit more adept, you want to make it harder and harder for them. They have to work a little bit harder before they get the mini game. Correct? Yes. So definitely, okay. in the beginning, you're going to want to, you know, set these settings to one. Okay. Um, and so the child can get used to playing and and getting rewarded for all that. Mm -hmm. um, the rounds, if they're doing well, can be completed rather quickly. Okay. And so if that's starting to happen you can always go back and change the preference assessment to five so after every five games we check is this still rewarding for them okay and then um, we'll store those new values and same for the mini game so if they get through five rounds then they get rewarded with the mini game after because part of the key to this is keeping them involved keeping them happy as yes. long as they're as long as they're happy and staying involved you're gonna get more learning opportunities in. so we, we want to customize it to where the child to, to the individual child and where they are in their learning process okay what next uh, the last setting would be the manage exemplars and so this allows you to turn on and off the different targets that the kid, the child is working on. Okay. Um, 
we'll leave them all on for now. Okay. Um, and then we will. So ultimately, very customizable. Okay, so you're going into objects right there, and we've got all these different things to choose from in objects. Uh, and and the, the print is a little small for me, so read off what the, some of the different balloons are. So level one is matching identical. Um, so they'll be matching identical pictures of objects. Okay. Uh, level two is matching similar, so similar um, images. Level three is sorting those images, and level four is receptive identification. Okay, great. And as you can see in this one, level four, um, I was playing a little bit, and it already shows you that they've mastered some of those, and okay. so it goes in and shows you that they've uh, gotten 6% okay. through that level. Okay, great. Because if you're sitting and playing this with your child, it really helps you to see, you know, to get an idea right in the beginning. And maybe, you know, I know sometimes I'll give my son an app and I'll sit with him for a couple of times and I'll walk away and I'll stir dinner and I'll come back, you know, and encourage him to do something um, on an app. But so great visual. I'm a very visual person. And yeah. so for me to see, oh, well, you know, so he's been working on that. Great. Okay, so pick one and let's play. Let's do a preference assessment. So we will go with uh, sorting because it's the short so we can go through everything. Okay. Okay, so this is the preference assessment, and it starts off, and you can choose any of the buttons. So if you choose the fish, the fish animation plays. Okay. Um, now, as you see, the, the button position switches. Right, um, the fish is in a different place now. Yeah, we didn't want to mm -hmm. have it a situation occur where a child was only pushing the same position on the screen. Right, because it might just be that it's reinforcing th for them to push that area, and what we want is whatever the animation is to be reinforcing to them. Yes. Okay, so, and all we're really doing here is is seeing what they like. This isn't the learning portion yet, we're just seeing what kinds of things does the child like, because we're gonna play these when they do something right. Yes. Uh, so that it will be reinforcing to them. So they should find that fun. Okay, and, and it makes it, it makes them push a button several different times, and they get the reward every time they push the button. Um, and, and you might think as a parent, what's happening? I don't understand. This We're not learning anything yet, but what, what the, the app is doing is learning what your child likes, because uh, they're going to give that to your child when they do something fun. Okay, so right now, you're matching, uh, and, and yeah, so we see the little uh, card on the bottom, we're matching things that are similar similar right now. So this, oh, this is one sorting. Sorting them. Okay, so things that go together. So the ducks are going to go together on this one. Uh, so this isn't the easiest level, um, but, and, and each time that uh, CJ is doing it, he's getting the reward of whatever, the, whatever he had picked in that first level. And you see that it's not very long, and now they get to pick a mini game. Well, I want to see the fireworks, CJ. See the fireworks, okay. <laughs> I'm all about the fireworks. Okay, and what does the child get to do here? So you just get to oh, tap how, around. Oh, how beautiful is this? Go. The sounds are really good too, and you can use, you know. And so that we can talk, we're once. leaving the sound off for, for now, but absolutely beautiful. So this continues on for like 30 seconds that the child gets to play, and then it goes back into the game again. Yes, we wanted it to be as close to I guess a loop as, as possible. So okay. preference assessment, game, and then if you push continue, you're gonna go back into the preference assessment. Okay, so it's gonna, and, and, and honestly, you know, you, you might think that that is so over the top, but if, if we were having a great therapist doing work with our child, they would do a preference assessment this often as well too. And, and that's part of the key to the success because if the child really wants something, then they're gonna continue doing it. Yes. I think as parents, we go, really? Because they just said they wanted this, uh, and yet we change our tastes minute to minute too. You could offer me a latte now and I could say yes, and then five minutes later say, I'm not in the mood for a latte, right? Uh, so it, it's going to keep asking for the preference assessment. It's going to keep them involved. They're going to appreciate the animations. And again, we can track all of the progress, correct? Yes. I will show you um, the chart once this finishes. Okay. Um, but it, uh, progress is divided between each level. Uh -huh. um, we don't have an overall progress one, um, but... Uh, we separated them for each level, so matching, um, sorting, and receptive. I'll show you that now. Okay. So it's so. in the user settings or the player, um, the player panel, and you just go to progress, and it shows you right there. Great. So as a parent, after I've 
put my child to bed at night, uh, you know, I can take a second, sit down and look at the app and say, while I was cooking dinner, what was my child learning and how are they doing? And not only that, eventually, as you said, the supervisor will be able to look at it in skills and say, well, how does this match up with what we're trying to do? It's all about getting more done. And, and I think this is, this is just the wave of the future and really remarkable. And I'm so thrilled that you are on the job taking care of this. Uh, because, I, and, and as we see more games that will be coming out and more aspects of Camp Discovery, it's more opportunity for our kids to learn. It, it's really remarkable. Thank you. Okay. All right. So again, you can find Camp Discovery on the uh, Apple Store, the App Store, and go there. It's free. This is available to you today. Put this in your child's hands today, and we would love to hear how you guys like it. So be right in and let us know what you think of it. And more will be coming of this nature. Th CJ, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. We are going to take a break and watch the A Word. This is the ongoing documentary being made here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders following. Jack Riley, a little boy who was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. We're back at the beginning of the series, and this is right when therapy is about to start to happen for this little boy. And it's a difficult time for the family. The waiting has been difficult, and even getting started and letting a bunch of virtual strangers into your home to come in and work with your child, it can be overwhelming. It's all to the good, but it doesn't change the fact that you have feelings and emotions about it as it's happening. So take a look at the A word, and then when we come back, we'll be here with Nancy Allspot Jackson for Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. Everybody's agreed and held hands that early intervention is key. Then I can't, I can't imagine why. In the regional center, we knew on November 2nd that we didn't speak or make much noise at all during the evaluation. They knew that on that day. I, I can't comprehend for the life of me why we even take a month to start speech therapy. That doesn't make any sense to me. The waiting's hard. The waiting's really hard. We read things about how the brain is so much more malleable the younger they are. You know, every day that ticks by just seems like a waste of time. You know, you go on the websites and you read all these things and and there's kind of a club, I think, of moms who call themselves autism warriors. And I hated that word when I first read it. I hated it. I still do. Because I don't, you know, there's a lot of things I wanted to fight for, but I didn't have to fight for autism. Yeah. It's okay, man. We're lucky in that he sprints to mom. Okay, this is how my son reacts to me coming home. Oh, Jack Riley. Hi! Mommy's home! Mommy's home! Hello! When he sprints to me when I get home, and uh, and he, he kisses you and hugs you. And... <laughs> Where's my son? <laughs> One of the first people that I told when we got the diagnosis was a good friend of mine who knew somebody who had uh, an adopted son who has autism and had not only fought the fight, I mean, talk about autism warrior, this woman founded a whole foundation and was extremely active and extremely knowledgeable and my friend put me on the phone with her. She was the one who turned me on to both ABA and to CARD and to tell me how valuable it was and we're very grateful for it because yes. we, we realized that had we not been given information, we never would have known the regional center would not have recommended that for us. So it, it, it required us to really, really push to get what we wanted. And I didn't know even until I asked the question if I had a choice. I thought this was great advice. Don't ever feel at, that you're at the mercy of the regional center because they're paying for your services. She told me, you're paying for your services. They're using tax money to do this and you've paid taxes. And take a card it was actually a much more pleasant experience than the regional center evaluation. I think in part because we've been through it once and, and it wasn't as scary for us. It was a good experience for us because we felt like our son was himself. He had all the same things going on as far as autism is concerned, but he was still bright and happy and affectionate. I felt like he showed them both his, his good sides and, and the sides that he needs to work on. So for us it felt good because we felt like at least people were seeing what we see. I felt maybe for the first time that they got it, that it's like, okay. Uh, he he is this way, this is what he's got going on, but we, we can make this better. At first, it was exhausting to think that every single thing was a teaching moment. 
that every single thing that he did, and I know that, you know, I would say something to him, and he'd be like, really? <laughs> Can we just feed him? Can yeah. we just feed him dinner, and we don't have to worry about it? But now even that's not as exhausting, because it's sort of starting to become more natural for us, mm -hmm. so that it doesn't feel as awful. But I remember feeling guilty just for being with him all day, and then, you know, just sort of sneak the TV on to Sports Center in the afternoon, and he's playing with his Legos, and I just back up and lean against the sofa with him between my feet. But I wasn't really watching him. I would just try to watch Sports Center for a few minutes, and then I'd always feel guilty and and uh, try to get over that. <laughs> so no more guilt. I think we're teammates. Um, that's the the best thing. Is I feel like she's on my side. I'm on her side. We sort of, uh, we've been lucky that my weak moments are his strong moments. Well, on a personal note, is the camera still on? It is. <laughs> on a personal note, um, I would be lost. Um, she, she really dove in. And I mean, I've Googled autism, and I still don't understand it until she explains it to me. Um, and, Which is scary because I don't really understand it. Well, that's the point. But she, she dives to the next step. Um, and I'm just tr starting to understand the last step, and she's trying to explain the next step. And um, I told her last night I would be lost if she wasn't doing that because I, I wouldn't. Uh, I don't think I could. Sometimes I'm reading these things, and and uh, it just floats over me because I'm I go numb again reading about it. Well, I think in in, in fairness, I, I think one one person in each family has to take that role because yeah. I don't think you can both drive. I think there's always somebody in every family who just takes takes that role. Yeah. If somebody takes charge, take a back seat. <laughs> that's that's the moral of that. I mean that. <laughs>
Dr. Doreen Grampache. About one in 670 men with Kleinfelter syndrome, which is caused by having two X chromosomes and one Y, men with a disorder have symptoms consistent with having low levels of testosterone, such as small testes and enlarged breasts. Studies also suggest that they have an increased risk a risk, excuse me, of developing neurological disorders such as schizophrenia. In this new study, researchers combed the Swedish National Patient Registry to find 860 men with Kleinfelter syndrome living in Sweden. They matched each of these men with 100 men from the general population born in the same year and country. Men with the Kleinfelter syndrome are four times more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder and six times more likely to have a diagnosis of autism than the control group. This is what the study found. If it, it okay, and I, I'm told that Nancy is here, so I, I'm, I'm going to leave off at this because there's a, another story that I want to cover uh, that I'd love to have Nancy's input. Uh, I don't know if any of you read The Age of Autism, but Katie Wright, who is the daughter of Bob and Suzanne Wright, the founders of Autism Speaks, uh, wrote a pretty interesting article that was featured this week in The Age of Autism. So we're going to take a break. We're going to get Nancy in here, and we're going to talk about it. Stick with us. When you find out you're having a boy, you always think like, oh, he's going to play football, he's going to do this and that. And then when he's diagnosed, all those things get washed away. It's like that piece that's always in the back of your mind, you know, where is he, what is he doing, is he safe? We really didn't know what we were dealing with. I wish that they could have directed me a little bit more and provided me some information. I was a young mom. I didn't know what it was like to raise a boy despite a boy with autism. Hundreds of thousands of families are not getting the help they need for their children with autism all around the country. ACT Today is determined to bridge the gap. These families really have to go through a lot to get a grant. The application process isn't easy. The records, the diagnosis proof, they're really battling for their kids. So when we can give them a grant, it is so wonderful to see that they succeed in getting that help for their children. Our founder, Dr. Doreen Grampache, is an amazing woman, and she is one of the world's foremost authority on behavior of children with autism. She's extremely knowledgeable, and she oversees every single grant we give. She is part of that process. People may think of autism care and treatment as simply schooling or therapy, but you know, we provide important safety supports, things like fencing, for example. The whole family's living in fear of that child running out into traffic. I recently delivered an iPad to a little boy with some of the apps that are out there for children with autism. Miracles happen. I got the iPad from an act. From act. What yeah. did it say? Can you repeat that, Dustin? I got the iPad from that. We have helped so many military families. And when I think of these brave families that are fighting two battles, one to protect our country and one for the right treatment and care for their children, it, it breaks my heart. And I think we have to do more as a nation to help them. There's not a day that doesn't go by that we don't think about it. Some people say, oh, he's normal. You don't see the battles that I see every single day. My husband does have to deploy, and when they get on that bus, that might be the last time that my kids ever see them. So I called, and then they informed me that he had received the grant, which was like a blessing from above. I was just like speechless. I just started to cry because, you know, without it, we would, we would have been lost. The ACT grant was a total miracle, and without that, they wouldn't be able to receive a service dog, so we're so appreciated what they've done for us as a family. Recently, ACT Today funded a program for military children with autism in San Diego, the Inclusion Films program, which is run by Joey Travolta, and teaches uh, kids on the autism spectrum literal filmmaking skills. They learn how to make a movie. Are we ready? There you go, got it. Okay. Everything that goes into the process of making a film goes into everyday life. So they're learning life skills, they're learning to collaborate. It was really nice to know how much they were enjoying this camp. 
and they're with people who are supporting them and are making them feel great about themselves and their differences and their similarities. And I get two kids that are working together and apart and together and apart, so it's an interrelationship as well as a camp and a learning experience. It's so fulfilling when I get letters. One stands out for me, a, a boy who was 14 with Asperger's, and we gave him a grant to go to a drama camp. He wrote to us and said, Dear Act Today, thank you for letting me belong for the first time in my life. These kids are remarkable. You know, we underestimate them. They're so knowledgeable, they're so capable, and we can change the life of a family, which means changing the life of a community. And we're back with Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. I'm a little late and, there. And now it's really massive, Shannon and Nancy. I was really in a massive traffic jam, and I don't know whether it had something to do with out near where I live. When I went to the bank this morning, they were saying that there was all this Justin Bieber stuff going on, which I had no clue. I'm not I a Bieberite. Is that what right. they call him? A, a believer. A, a believer. believer, okay. A believer. Right, I'm not a believer, and <laughs> but apparently the the gist of it was that somebody's house was egged by him, or they, I don't know. Yeah. But I thought, you know, if this is what causes the news vans to come out, and this is what people are preoccupied, I really do know why this country is in such a mess. <laughs> no kidding. Okay. No kidding. Because so, I, I said, I we hope everybody's okay. We understand you're yeah. stuck in horrible traffic, and I hope there's no loss of life. And it turns out it's all about believers. Well, you know. Really. Okay, okay, people. Uh, whatever. <laughs> so anyway, we were talking about in the news, and we had one story that came up, uh, not autism per se, but special needs, and it kind of sparked something in us because we are going to ba have back a special guest, Emily Island, Absolutely. who is an expert on safety for our kids, yes. and she has produced Be Safe the Movie, and this story made me realize once again how important it is, and we're going to talk about some other cases with yes. the police and our kids and how things could have been different, but in North Carolina, this was just a few days ago, two North Carolina parents are in shock after local police shot and killed their 18-year-old son in their own home. Home while they watched helplessly. The family called police because they were worried about their son, Keith Vidal, who is schizophrenic and suffers from depression. Uh, Vidal, armed with a small screwdriver, was having a psychotic episode. Mark Wilsey, Vidal's father, called the authorities to help deal with the situation. An officer from the Brunswick County Sheriff's Office and another from the Boiling Spring Lakes Police Department showed up at the house soon after. Eventually, a third officer entered the home, ordered the use of tasers to subdue the young man. And then, according to Wilsey, Vidal was pinned on the ground by two of the officers when a third said, we just don't have time for this, and shot Vidal, killing him. Vidal had just turned 18, weighed a mere 90 pounds. He couldn't have hurt anyone with a screwdriver, had no history of violence, uh, according to family and friends, and there was no reason to shoot this kid. The father said, they killed my son in cold blood. We called for help, and they killed my son. Uh, the mother suffered a mental breakdown, treated by medical staff, and no statement has been released yet by the New Brunswick County Sheriff's Office. Uh, has, no statement has been released yet. So, once again, a situation where apparently some massive misunderstanding, yeah. communication breakdowns in the case of someone's special needs. So, yeah. so And we've seen this time and time, time, again. And time again. And, and I, you know, it would be easy to sit and, and make generalizations about police officers, and yet we know that police officers, they're, they're there with the hopes, almost always, you know, we can't attest to everyone, but police officers mean well most of the time. Yeah. And, and we've got to train our kids. We've got to train our kids. So, and so let's segue yes, let's to segue. our guest today, Emily Island. Welcome Hello, back. Emily. Thank you so much and, for having me. Yes, she is our expert on this topic. And um, tell us about your project, mm -hmm. Be Safe, and what it can provide parents, law enforcement, uh, really anyone looking to keep our kids safe. Right. 
Well, you know, I, I have extensive training and experience training the police. I've trained thousands of police about autism mm -hmm. and realized that it was not enough mm -hmm. to keep our kids safe because the police are trained to shoot you if they think you're reaching for a weapon and you're going to kill them. So they will shoot you whether you have autism or not, whether they've been trained about autism or not. They're responding to what they see and they have certain ideas of what a threat is. So I thought, if we're not training our children specifically how to interact with the police, then they are at risk. We are leaving them to this huge vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I um, made this movie, Be Safe the Movie, with Joy Travolta and the students at Inclusion Films. Mm -hmm. And it has seven episodes. So for those that don't know Joey, I think most of you do, we've had him on many times, he works with children on the spectrum and actually involves them in the filmmaking. So everyone that worked on this uh, most pretty likely, much on the spectrum. Pretty much about on 80 the spectrum. percent of the filmmakers right. at Inclusion Films have uh, mostly autism and other disabilities. Yes. They're teens and young adults mm -hmm. who are preparing for careers in the film industry. Right. Yeah. So this movie was made by and for people Love on the it. spectrum. Okay. They also gave me input into the script. But we have seven different scenarios that show our young people what to do and say when they meet the police. Now think about how appealing video is to people on yeah. the spectrum. Mm -hmm. How about giving them positive video models that they can watch and copy? They don't watch and copy in real life. They don't learn it when we tell them what to do, but they can learn it from a video. This is evidence-based. Absolutely. And it, it really is remarkable because it, we can take the attitude of just being in fear or we can take action and teach actual skills to our young people so that they will understand what to do and stay safe. And one of, one of the skills is stay where you are when you meet the police. We don't want the kids running away mm -hmm. and we teach it in the movie five different ways. Some people say it's repetitive. Well, it's that's, what, it's repetitive. that's what works. <laughs> that's what works. Right. Yes. We, we look at it from, we show them, we tell them and then they have watch a conversation with the police and the actors in the movie about mm -hmm. why did you run or why didn't you run. Another skill we teach is make sure you follow all instructions the police give you. Now, mm -hmm. how good are our kids at following instructions? Maybe not so good, mm -hmm. but we explain why and we help them understand the importance and we have to help them practice. Yes. We don't want a police encounter to be the first it. time right. that they are supposed to do a bunch of yeah. skills they haven't practiced mm -hmm. or don't understand. Absolutely. And another skill is telling the police about your autism. Mm -hmm. uh, it's such a help to the police to know about the disability, even in the 911 call, and we model and practice all of this. If you think about it, you know, we, we practice fire drills mm -hmm. and, and things of that nature at school. We should be practicing this kind of thing as well. Absolutely. And so the, the movie, we prime with, we build 110 safety vocabulary words because how do we expect people to be safe if they don't have an active safety vocabulary? Right. If they don't know what, you know, self-incrimination is, they need to know, you know, at the level they can understand it, they mm -hmm. need to know. Absolutely. Say nothing if you get arrested. So, Emily, where can they get the movie? Mm -hmm. It's at BeSafeTheMovie.com, and there are two products. The first is Be Safe The Movie, which is the 60-minute film on DVD, mm -hmm. which are the seven episodes and lessons, uh, the seven episodes. But I have a second item, which is Be Safe Teaching Edition, and it is the movie plus a 300-page curriculum. Lovely. And how is this being distributed to schools? Well, so far, it's getting the word out to schools so that they purchase it. Um, you know, I'm a professor at Cal State Northridge, and I teach special educators. And when I made my movie, I could hear the teachers saying, well, I need extra materials, other things. I need visuals. I created them. And they're on this CD-ROM. And I just want to show you what, what, what it looks like to print out that CD-ROM. Yeah. It, this is what the curriculum looks like if you print it out. Three, I'm just going to have you hold it out for yeah. yourself uh -huh. a little bit for your microphone. 300 pages. Okay. Yeah. Of things. Very extensive. Yeah. And, you know, um, let me just, like, for example, this. We want people to respect the boundaries with the police. Don't cross the boundaries. Don't touch their stuff. But I said, well, what if kids... What if our young people don't know what boundaries are? Yeah. So I did a whole photo series of personal space and boundaries. Love it. Uh, with visuals and these lovely actors, a whole series. Because we can't say you need to keep your boundaries with the police if they don't know what boundaries are. Right. right. So I have all this foundational material and lots of visuals mm -hmm. uh, so that people can 
can see what that is. Uh, another thing in the curriculum are all of the scripts of all of the scenarios in the movie so people can role play and reenact right. the script. So mm -hmm. now they're saying the safe words and mm -hmm. they're doing the safe things. And one wonderful thing I love about providing the scripts from the movie is that they can role play and reverse the role and let our, our kids be, be the police mm -hmm. to kind of take that perspective and role play that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Love it. And so again, if, if you're a teacher, you're going to want to have this, but if you're a parent and you want to gift this to your child's school, Emily, Absolutely. where do they buy it? Be safe. The movie.com is the only place that these are available. Okay. And I really do recommend that people buy the curriculum if they're going to give it to a school. Okay. Okay. After, and I recommend that people watch a scene from the movie and then use materials. So mm -hmm. here's another example. This is a red and green card. And it, this one is for um, a medical emergency. And it says what I will do and what I won't do. And it's just a way to structure the information and someone could pick this card out of all the materials in this lesson say that's mine that's the one i'm going to own mm -hmm. that's the one that appeals to me mm -hmm. but for someone else it might be a different you know i, I provide a huge variety of materials for every lesson mm -hmm. somebody else might want um to use uh this card to prepare for a 911 call before in advance. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so these would be things that we would give the individual that we're teaching. They would fill it out. They could keep it with them. Yes, mm -hmm. um, keep one on the fridge. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you've practiced. How? What's? What would happen if something happened to you? Would your child know how to call 911? Yeah. Good. Um, good. But yeah, that's no, because I, you're that, I don't know. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm saying yes. That's a good thing. I don't know for sure. What would, I would happen? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what would happen. So after that call might be made, I have no idea what would be said and happened. Yeah. Right. And um, so the curriculum, you know, I'm very happy with it because I, it's for diverse learners of all cognitive levels and all language levels. There's something for everybody. And what ages every would lesson. you say? I would start in junior high. Okay. Okay. Because that's important to you. Yeah. Absolutely. All Although right. I will say that there are probably some things in this that we could start earlier. Absolutely. And yeah. like, for example, I have these cards. I'll lift it up in a second to show you. But they're the self-disclosure cards. Uh -huh. That uh, These are templates that you can print and use that say, I have autism, uh -huh. please speak slowly, right. do not hold me face down. Right. Because right. one of the reasons our kids are dying is because they don't have the breath support and they have the low tone in the trunk and they are, they, they're suffocating. It, yeah. Can we talk about some of the cases? Yeah, sure. brought some You know what, cases. let's do, do that. Let's take a break. Let's and take we'll a break and back. then we're gonna talk and about, some, talk about recent some things that yeah. might have. Recent stories in the news, and we're gonna break it down. If this individual had known this, this, and this, which is in the curriculum, how it might have had a different outcome. Because yes. that's Great. really what we wanna focus yeah. on. Sure. So stick with us, more with Emily Island after these yeah. messages. Dr. Doreen Grand is the Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Doreen Grand Dr. Grand Dr. Doreen Grand Dr. Doreen Grand is a visionary in the field of autism, and now you get to ask her questions every Wednesday at 10 a.m. on Ask Dr. Doreen. Welcome back to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy, and we are here with Emily Island learning how to be safe. And Emily, you've been talking to us about the movie, the, the whole curriculum on Be Safe, and we wanted to come back and cover uh, some recent situations, you know, in the past year or so that have happened with some of our kids. What might have been handled differently in some of these. Can you just yes. review a few of them? Yes, I can. Well, one thing <clears throat> I like to encourage parents to do not call the police unless a crime or life-threatening situation is happening. Okay. Do not call the police to teach your kids a lesson. Mm -hmm. And do not call the police to handle your child's behavior unless it's criminal or life-threatening. People think the police will come in and help, and sometimes they can, but other times, it escalates it worse, and it sure. makes it worse and I have a friend who's a policeman who says once you ring that bell you can't unring it so mm -hmm. once the police are in your house they are in charge and you have no more control over the situation mm. and if that's it, very important, important to know yes. but yes. you would want to call them if it is life, life threatening. threatening yes but they will if, if they think the person has a weapon they will respond accordingly yeah. Yeah. Uh, never tell the police someone has a weapon when they don't think okay. in the police arrive quicker that's another mistake people make okay um, the other thing is 
letting the police know about the person's disability be as they're arriving. So you tell the 911 operator, this is a person with autism. They have sensory sensitivities. We need to back up and let, help them calm down. We're, at, we're asking you to come to help this person calm down. But, but they have autism. And the first reaction of someone with autism to the police is fight or flight. Mm -hmm. of course. That's everybody's first That's reaction. That's everybody's first reaction. But we can afraid. repress it. Yeah. We can repress it, and someone with autism doesn't have other mm -hmm. alternatives. Mm -hmm. right. And if they f fight or run, it's not going to turn out well. So the idea is to teach our kids to stay where they are, mm -hmm. to give them ways to calm down and talk them through things, and um, you know, to help them learn to follow instructions and to become comfortable with police procedures. One of the uh, procedures in the um, curriculum I call how to get arrested safely, mm -hmm. and it shows the 12 steps and if they can practice, put your hands in the air, one arm behind, the next arm behind, put your head down when you're getting in the car. Mm -hmm. And I want our young people to go out and practice these things. Yeah. Yeah, they need to know what that feels like yeah. so they can be calm about it instead mm -hmm. of being totally freaked out mm -hmm. and unprepared, which yeah. is what we're setting our kids up to do if we're not actually explicitly teaching. Mm -hmm. There's a part in the film where you show a mistaken identity and a young man who's on the autism spectrum who police pull up and think that he is, has robbed a convenience store and guns are pulled yes. and they tell him to put his hands up and I went cold when I saw that because I thought, oh my goodness, how would my son react in this situation? He, he, exactly. My son, why? Mm -hmm. would run. My son would run too. My son would scream and scream yell and run, run and exactly. think that it was, you know, impossible who were going to kill him. And then, they, and then the police are thinking, why is this young man running if he doesn't right. have something and to hide? Well. It does escalate, mm -hmm. and that is a problem. And that's why I want these positive models, like, oh, look, this is happening to me, just like the boy in the movie. Remember what he did? And, and the, he was okay. Yeah. And it will be okay, and they will realize that they have the wrong person, but mm -hmm. this is what he needed to do for it to be safe. And that's exactly what this Be Safe, the movie, is about. Right. It's about teaching those skills. And I love, Emily, how you how you look at it from everybody's perspective. How, the, from the police perspective, from the young man's perspective, from the person who was robbed perspective, so that we can we can look at that and go, oh, that's why the police pulled the gun. I also like you, you have a page in here, an information page. Yes. Can you tell us yes. about that? This is called the Special Needs Information Page, and it's free at Be Safe the Movie, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, my website. Mm -hmm. But it's also part of the curriculum. And what it is is an information page that you fill out, two pages about your person, about their, their unique qualities, and who to call if they get in trouble. So you fill it out in advance of any kind of an emergency. You keep one at home, you keep one in the car, you keep one in your student's backpack. And that way, if the police are ever called, you've got everything they need to know. Okay. The, my police friends told me that it would take them at least an hour to gather this information. Mm -hmm. And when I made this form with the LA County Sheriffs in Santa Clarita, they said, well, could you move this part to the top called suggestions for approaching and calming the person? So after their name and their picture, it says suggestions for approaching and calming this person. We have got to give the police this information mm -hmm. yeah. so they can do a better job. Give them the tools. Yes. And be prepared. It's about us thinking it through, yeah. anticipating different mm -hmm. situations, and being very active in our plan to prepare to keep our children safe as they're you know, moving through elementary school, as they were transitioning to high school and college. And we want them to have a safe adult life. Yes. And all our work we do for our children could be undone in one moment mm -hmm. yeah. if we don't prepare. All right. Very important. Once again, they can connect with you. Be safe, the movie. Be oh, yeah, and we're going to give away. Yeah. We're going to give away that. one of the movies and one of the curriculum. Okay. We're going to put up a picture today of, of this show. Mm -hmm. And if people like it and comment, we'll, um, between now and Friday night at, at 11.59, okay. we will randomly pick a couple people for the giveaway of the Great. curriculum and the movie. And that is on your Facebook, Be, be, be safe, safe the Movie. Yes, Be Safe the Movie. Okay. Great. Are we going to take a little bit of time to talk about some specific stories and how they can help? Sure. Okay, so let's start with uh, number one. Stefan Watts, age 15, in February of 2012 in Calumet City, Illinois. A uh, 15-year-old shot to death after attacking police, uh, and he was on the autism spectrum. The mm -hmm. police were called when the 15-year-old with Asperger's syndrome would not get off the computer and go to school. So what I talked about calling the police when it's mm -hmm. a crime yeah. or a life-threatening emergency. And 
I don't want to judge this family. We don't know what their situation was. But the general idea is, you know, only call the police when it's a crime. Because if, if the student's upset and things escalate. Yes, and it did escalate. Uh, the, uh, when the police arrived, the, as the story goes, he attacked the police, cutting one officer's arm with a knife. And that is when they shot him, and he is now dead. Yes. And if they see a knife and it, if they feel threatened, their job is to go home alive right. at the end of the day Absolutely. and the police will tell you that yeah. so if they think they could die they will shoot to kill yeah. that you is know, what the police are trained to do terrifying. The, the, the statement from you you cannot unring that bell yes every parent needs to know that let's move on to nicholas passeri age 18 uh in florida 2011 police called out to a domestic disturbance after they were forced to shoot and kill an 18 year old man armed with a knife shortly after entering the apartment he shared with his mother nicholas had asperger's syndrome difficulty with social interaction they were having an argument it escalated she called officers hoping they would take nicholas to a mental evaluation center instead she said two officers walked into her apartment and within seconds there were three gunshots and her son was dead so we have to know that our kids cannot have anything in their hands when they're with the police and if they have something in their hands we have to practice and practice till they can follow the instruction put it down yeah because if they put it down now this happens yeah but if they keep it in their hand this happens yeah and i'm i'm not judging the situation but i'm just saying what can we learn from situations like this um and we have to in the movie that's why i show do not have always show your hands we teach in the positive but there's one negative i show never reach yes because they think you're reaching for a gun and we yeah. know that one a young man in la was killed and it's happened elsewhere because when he reached they thought he was reaching for a weapon. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They had reason to believe. And that's all it takes. They have that's a split second to make these decisions. And I will say, too, I think a lot of people get, there's a moment that happens at home, and, and the, uh, things are escalating, and the kids are reacting, and the parent feels like, I can't control, and I don't know what's going to happen. And it, then they pick up, and this mother was calling, saying, I want you to come and take him to a mental health facility and get him medication, but maybe the police aren't the people to call when that's what it is that you're looking for. True. You could call a mental health crisis hotline, and they would send the SMART team. There the we smart go. SMART team especially trained mm -hmm. so calling 911 if you give the right information that you need a smart team for someone okay. with a disability or a special team for mental health in, uh, in LA it's called the mental evaluation unit or the smart team they're specially trained great information I didn't know that I did didn't you know, know that, that? I okay good to know so uh, ask for a smart team and and also work in advance so that Absolutely. the person does not have a weapon because it takes a whole right. different route yes if right. the police feel threatened and anyone could you know even a screwdriver a kitchen knife it's considered a life or death threat Absolutely. and it's treated as that um now this the situation with uh mohammed shadri age 21 um this was in los angeles yes and you're very familiar with this situation um he was an adult on the spectrum out in the community on his own but he started calmly but escalated uh, because he became preoccupied he had preoccupations obsessions brooms cars lizards he became preoccupied with how people survive in tough places and started sleeping at 18 around outdoors and weeks before the shooting he was arrested after police found him with a baton that he said was for his own protection and according to the police uh, he seemed cordial to the officers at first you know handed over his ID was having nice conversation and then um, po the police say he lunged at them with a the knife and they shot him whether you have autism or not if you lunge at the police with a knife they will shoot you yeah and so that's what we have to teach our kids not to do now our our children grow up with their preoccupations mm -hmm. and they have unusual behaviors and the police that that brings all their alarm bells right why is this person sleeping under a bush are they a threat are they a, you know what is going on 
and uh, their first reaction is it's a person on drugs or you know right. yeah. those yeah. types yeah. of things and they wouldn't imagine that it's autism um, if we can get the person to wear a medical alert bracelet of the wonderful varieties that they're making now that yeah. are tolerable mm. they're not all metal and horrible they you have velcro one ones Okay, a lot of, are, lot of waking up, a lot yeah, of yes, wake up things. I should, have, I should have made a list of 20 things. <laughs> I've got a her. list right here there for you. Okay, Emily you made make, the list. So you do that for us. Can I say how in awe I am of you? You are no, so thank you. organized. I, well, I thought it through on the curriculum. I tried to think of <gasps> everything I could. And if, someone, if I forgot something, people should tell me, and I'll put it on my Facebook or my website. But I really did try to think of every possible way we could prepare people to be safe, communicate more, and keep it calm right yeah okay. and you know having used all these things and advocated appropriately you have an adult son who's on the autism spectrum who's living in his own apartment he is with his girlfriend which makes yeah. me even happier because yes. that's what he wanted for himself but I I gave Tom a card that says I have autism and then one day he went to get it out of his pocket mm. and he's thinking oh I'm getting out my autism card but what are the police thinking uh, that he's reaching so, he so here I am training my yes. kids Yes. to be safe and he did the most unsafe thing possible and that was my fault because I uh -huh. didn't think it through. So now what do you advise? I tell people I actually have a, a section in the video where you ask the police if you can show your ID that says that you have autism. There can I go. show you my autism card? Okay. The woman in the film says it when she's pulled over for speeding. A boy in a picture says it when you know we go through the extra mm -hmm. materials in the curriculum and the idea is you ask first or if you wear a medical alert they're trained to look for it so they will ask okay. you, what does that okay. say? Okay. okay. Medical right. alert. Mm -hmm. Big Emily, lesson thank here. Thank you for all the work that you thank do for you. our community. Yeah. We, yeah. we walk behind you in gratitude. Yes, oh, we thank did. Thank you very much. Yeah. I hope that this will make a difference in someone's life. And I, I know it will. I yes. do need help getting the word out. Um, so that people can get their hands on these materials and use them. Be okay. safe the movie. We'll Go to Facebook and like the picture and see if you can win one of these fabulous packages. Thank you. But thank you so much, Emily. Oh, my pleasure. We're, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, Nancy and I are going to talk about oh. a couple of things. We're going to talk about news. Katie Wright mm -hmm. um, and what she had to say about Autism yeah. Speaks, but we're also going to talk about this Saturday, our sons went together to Knott's Berry Farm, it and we'll tell fun. about that. It was yeah. really fun. So stick <laughs> with us. When Maddie was diagnosed, I'll be honest, I was very ignorant on what autism was. I knew that autism was basically something that hit boys at the age of two to three and shut down. And sometimes you think of the typical Rain Man uh, movie. Um, and with Maddie, she was doing all the same signs and symptoms of a, of a typical child with autism spectrum disorder. Stand up. didn't even acknowledge us coming into the room. Um, she had barely any eye contact. Um, she didn't interact with her sister. She didn't really do anything. She just basically lined up her toys and that was about it. We have a team of seven volunteers, or, or eight now, eight volunteers, including my husband and I, and I'm the team leader, and so I do all the curriculum and get everything ready each week. Jana was downstairs until 11 o'clock at night working on curriculum, going through two different textbooks. And then we, as a group, meet on Monday nights, and we would go through what the curriculum was from Jana. And a lot of times we would go, well, how exactly do you do that? How do you sit her at the table and, and do this trial base? Well, what skills has done for us, it's, it's taken that away from Jana trying to figure out the curriculum for one, she can go down, or on our, even our laptop, and she can sit down and through all these questions, it comes up with the different programs. At least for me, it was a relief off my shoulders. I was worried that I might be missing something, um, missing a curriculum that maybe she needs to know, where the skills, they have every, every possible thing your child needs to know from zero to seven. They have a program for that. What noise is this? Every program that we did with her, I knew it was specific for what she needed to learn. Because before skills, it was a lot of, okay, well, is that really age appropriate for a two-year-old? You know, because it's not generalized. It's anywhere from zero to seven. This is what your child needs to know in most, in most manuals you'll find. Um, but for this, 
Okay, yep, she should be learning this. And no, she's not four yet. She doesn't need to know that yet. We are so fortunate that Jana was able to attend a conference put on by CARD that opened the door for skills and that um, there's no looking back for us. We started using the program in November and it seemed like by January something just clicked and she has completely kind of came out of her fog that she was in for quite a while. I have never read a documented case on any child that has not benefited anything from applied behavior analysis and uh, now with this new skills and being you know like the e version of ABA I can't imagine that it doing anything harmful to their child it, it's nothing but exponential growth for us to see her now it is it just blows us away I mean, we call her our little miracle child because um, in seven months time she has just blossomed into this normal functioning child and suddenly we joke about it all the time like suddenly we have twins if you're even thinking about doing it do it because the absolute worst thing you can do is do nothing at all and even if you use this program and it's just a single mom or a single dad working in the evenings with their child this program is going to benefit them it's it's going to show you where they are it's going to show you where they need to go and it's going to show you what skills and how to get there it is an online book on how to help recover your child. We're back with Let's Talk Autism. We are, and lots to talk about. Uh, not a whole lot of time to talk about it. But uh, this week in the Age of Autism, uh -huh. Katie Wright, who is the daughter of uh, Bob and Suzanne Wright, mm -hmm. they are the, the founders, founders of Autism Speaks. Uh -huh. uh, you know, and Katie has been amazingly outspoken uh, you know I do find myself wondering what is dinner like when they get together as a family you know because she has been amazingly critical sometimes of things that autism speaks to and I would uh -huh. encourage everybody to go to age of autism you'll have to scroll down a little bit because it was earlier uh -huh. uh, at the end of last week that it happened I think it was last Friday that it came out uh, but she says in it uh, you know that because dr. Rob ring became their new chief science officer uh -huh. um, a, almost a year ago that she was giving some time before she spoke out to yes. say because she wanted to see something different yeah. happening she thought and, ah, she was very happy to for this change to take yeah. place and to see that some really critically needed research would be done yeah and um, while she says you know there are some things that gave me hope she gives a very detailed critique of the kinds of things that they have been giving money to for research which, mm -hmm. research, which I found to be very fascinating um, you know because she says I, I, as a parent that she's pretty much done with do we have to have any more studies funded about what the early signs are mm -hmm. like or do we already know yeah. this do we have to have any more eye tracking right. studies right. I mean is that where where is that going to get us yeah um, do we have to well, the, the, those are the main, um, let's see, I'm looking but at the there, brain there, imaging, and um, there are over 5,000 published studies on autism and genetics, and they are continuing to fund tons of research in this area. Um, she kind of sums it up by saying that um, she thought it all sounded very good. But the, these grants are largely disappointing and so painfully conservative in nature that I cannot remain silent. Um, I have tried very hard behind the scenes for years to lobby for better research. No one at AS Science is listening. Our ASD children and young adults deserve so much better. So I think she's basically saying this, this is a failure. There have been some good things here, but a lot of funding for things that have been funded to death. <laughs> and uh, well, it's very a shocking when funding, you look at it. Yeah, lack of funding, uh, duplicate funding, and the research priorities of ASD families are not being funded. So let me give you a few of those: autism and GI disorders, disease. Um, Two hundred eighty-three studies, and that's something that fifty percent of families want to see more of. Uh, 
autism and gastrointestinal interventions to studies. Regressive autism, which Katie goes on to say affects 40% of kids with autism. Isn't anyone curious why toddlers are abruptly going mute and in my son's case, no longer recognizing family members and suddenly screaming all night and day? Only 87 studies. Uh, adverse vaccine reactions and autism. 27 studies, which she said, this happened to my child, countless now ASD children, and continues to happen every blanking day. How about we actually study these kids, not just Fragile X kids? Brilliant, Katie. I think they should put you in charge of this. You seem to have well, a lot more common sense. And Autism and autoimmune interventions, absolutely. only 71 studies. Autism and food allergies, only 51. PANDAS and autism, four studies. Brain inflammation, IVIG. Uh, okay. And the big one, number seven, on the last page that really caught my attention for autism and yeast fungal infections, uh, you know, this is something that so many people are talking about that there's only been 31 studies done. Yeah. Uh, and she says, in part two, I would like to discuss suggestions for reform. And she is asking you, what research would you have liked to have seen from Autism Speaks? And, uh, and she wants to know if she's missing something. So uh, she wants your opinion. So you can write in to Katie. She is a contributing editor for the Age of Autism, and let her know what you think about this. I think it's incredibly brave of her. I do, and um, I, I think that she makes very good points in every single one. And she's very, uh, very thorough and informed. Very thorough and informed. She did not leave herself leave herself open for somebody to come back and poke holes because the facts are the facts in the number of studies and then the facts are the facts in the percentages of parents that want to see other studies. So we, we've got to start listening to our people just like Washington does. And I also appreciate too that she's not saying that the whole of Autism Speaks is terrible. No, she She's just say saying that. I think we can be more effective here. Yeah. So I, I encourage people go to Age Autism, read the article and put your two cents and let Katie know what you'd like to see. Um, so uh, check that out. Now, I also mentioned that uh, you and I on Saturday, it was sort of a last minute kind of thing that mm -hmm. we came up with mm -hmm. that we decided mm -hmm. to go to Knott's Berry Farm and to take our sons to go there. And it was yes. a very interesting outing. <laughs> uh, and we, I, you know, we had a great time, I think, overall. We had overall. a great time uh, overall. <laughs> I, Wyatt was reticent to get on any fast ride because well, I ruined him with Pirates of the Caribbean. But he did really ago. well. He, he did, did well. He did really well. And we, and I, I would say, you know, I am not somebody who's, we'd only been to Knott's Berry Farm once before, mm -hmm. when right around when Jem was diagnosed, and it was like the hottest day on record, yeah. you know, it was 312 degrees out in the shade, that right. kind of a day. So we hadn't been back um, since then, and so we didn't really know the lay of the land, and I really think that knowing the lay of the land helps. So I felt like a fish out of water through a lot of the beginning of it, and the dietary thing was a big deal. I had looked, <laughs> yeah, it was about two hours to get lunch. Well, <laughs> you know me, and I always say on the show, do your research ahead of time, do your research ahead of time. And I did, I went and I looked because previously we'd had a hard time years, I mean, eight, nine years ago we went and we couldn't find anything GFCF while we were there, but I looked it up online to see if things had changed and lo and behold, there were all these articles about, they have all these great GFCF meals at uh, Knott's Berry Farm, but I couldn't find a menu with a ingredient list. So we had to do it on the ground. Mm. And, and as you said, it took us about two hours, although they ultimately, they were very sweet about it because it took so long to figure it out. Ultimately, we got a pretty fabulous GFCF meal, um, and they comped it. They didn't even know we were from the show. We didn't throw that card down, mm -hmm. but they said, you know, this took a long time to figure out. We want to mm -hmm. give it to you for free. Mm -hmm. But they had um, macaroni and cheese mm -hmm. that was GFCF, mm -hmm. and it was pretty rocking. I it, have to say, Wyatt, I tasted it. It, 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 it. He practically licked the plate. And they had um, hot dogs on a bun. My, right. my son has had a hot dog bun once before in his yeah. life, so this yeah. was like, you know, calling the troops. Right. This is amazing. You know, we're the fireworks so it's uh, fun yeah. it, you know so it did work out but it took a lot of our time uh -huh. um we we did a couple of great train rides yes. together it was really amazing yeah. but i gotta say too that I, you know uh i just was really impressed by you i really <laughs> i really was God. i was impressed by you and the way that you you know i i don't i haven't been to parks with a whole mm -hmm. lot of other autism moms mm -hmm. and just the way in which you dealt with wyatt and and with some of the things that came up as things come up, I was impressed by you. I, oh, I left you. and I said to my husband, 
I'm so proud of her. I'm so proud that I know her. I thought you were awesome. Uh, well, I kind of came away thinking you and Jim were pretty rocking parents. Don't you remember well, what I said to you? I'm like, I like hanging with you. You're so mellow. <laughs> we were like, we are? Compared we to are? my husband, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wyatt, don't say that. Wyatt, you know, Doug, I mean, I'm like, honey, remember, if you bring attention to things and you, and you get the voice up yeah. here. There was a moment, and I don't want, I don't want to like get specific about it, but there was a moment when, when something happened and I, I was like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Because as an autism parent, I was like, is she going to say something? Is she not going to yeah. say something? Somebody else is going to say something. Yeah. Somebody else did say something. Uh -huh. And you just smiled through the whole thing. <laughs> you didn't take issue with it. You didn't break what you were supposed to do, which was not give attention to right. it. And I just looked at you and I was like, she's a better woman than I am. That, <laughs> that's a woman. <laughs> that is an autism mom there and you rode the whole thing out and it was fine it was totally fine and the other person was fine with it as it all went down and and I was impressed with you I was very impressed with you well thank you Shannon <laughs> I can only take your thanks because it was like amazing. every other parent out there most of the time I feel like I'm not doing a great job at this that's just not the case lady and it is being the parent of a child with autism, I mean, warrior, you know, I have it on my wrist. That just begins to describe it for most of well, us. Well, I we could have had a team of BCBAs there, and they would have said she did exactly <laughs> the right thing. And I don't know very many parents that could have done that. So, in any case, I take it was all fun. compliments because I need them. <laughs> well, it's the truth, man. And I said it to my husband on the way home. I said, you know, I'm not going to, I said, dang, but I said something mm. else. I was like, that woman, whew. That's well, a woman. I've been spending a lot of time uh, in IEPs and at attorney's offices, special advocate, you know, our special advocate. And so it, because it's been on my brain, I thought we should have... Um, Oh, Eric Menyuk. Yes, He's coming next in week. next week. He's with Valerie Vanneman. He's an mm. attorney, special needs attorney. They've got a big conference going on about what you need to know about your school so district. That's so that's what we're going to cover next week. We can impart week. that to you because, right. man, do we ever know enough about our school districts no, and how to don't. get our services. But we're out of time today. Okay. I'm going to be back tomorrow at 10 a.m. and uh, I'll have Dr. Adele Nadowski okay. and Dr. Jonathan Tarbox with us. Great. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me. And give yourselves a hug from me. Bye-bye for now. Bye.